Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry and my special guest today is Dr. Jared Longshore. Uh, he's a pastor, he's a husband, he's a father. He's there in uh, Idaho with uh, Doug Wilson and that whole crew at Christ Church. Uh, welcome to the show. Jared, how you doing? Doing good, Richard. Thanks so much for uh, having me join you today. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you accepting the invitation. Uh, I know when you, I guess when you use the word transition, <laughs> not in any sort of leftist. That's a dangerous word. I know. Not in any sort of leftist LGBT stuff, but going from a prominent, I would call you prominent. You're definitely not big Eva, but you were well known there with Founders Ministry and serving with uh, Tom Askell and many others. And of course, on the podcast and, and serving there at the church and other things and transitioning and moving convictionally different to being there at Christ Church with Doug Wilson, Ben Merkel, Toby Sumter and those guys up in Idaho. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Why don't you just kind of flesh that out for you and how that changed um, your convictions, where you how long that took and and all the rest. Yeah, there have been at least some who have pondered if I'm like a, a big Eva um, sneak in and uh, <laughs> whether I have really made my way here as a mole for uh, oh, that's funny. for the ERLC or something like that. Who knows? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, well, obviously, I came convinced that not only believers, but believers and their children are to be baptized. And that was a massive deal. I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church in Central Florida and, um, you know, have tons of family that go to Baptist churches. And that was my whole um, world and began to reform as I got into college and discovered John Piper, Desiring God, discovered Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology, um, got into what I would call Calvinistic Baptist um, the Calvinistic Baptist position, which is essentially Calvinistic soteriology. So someone that holds the tulip, which I think characterizes a broad swath of American um, evangelicalism right now. They probably would call themselves reformed, um, but just Calvinistic soteriology, Calvinistic Baptist. But right right at that same time, um, discovered what I would call reform Baptists, which are more confessional Baptists. They hold to the second London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is, um, of course, very, very much like the Westminster Confession of Faith. And so discovered that um, that confession and was there for um, nearly all of my uh, 14, 15 years of pastoral ministry. I uh, went to Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And I remember going to Southern and I was um, I was a bit of a fish out of water there. And I knew I was when I was going because there was all this talk about New Covenant theology. Um, I think it's uh, Jason Meyer, who's the uh, pastor at um, Bethlehem. I think it might be Jason Meyer. That and, sounds uh, familiar. Yeah. Wrong. But he had just published his dissertation. Uh, I think he was at Southern did a dissertation on the end of the law. I remember reading that and thinking, I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. Um, did all my coursework up there and saw continuity with the issues of the law, met several um, men there who didn't believe in like the fourth command was still binding in the Christian mm -hmm. life. Um, and some maybe who would be hesitant about the law in general being binding uh, in the Christian life, um, indwelling of the spirit in the Old Testament. That was another thing. I, I, there were these moments that were sticking out to me, um, but I just thought, well, I see more continuity than um, than these guys here, especially on the issue of law and gospel. But if you would have asked me at that time about, about some particularities about the relationship of the Abrahamic Mosaic and Davidic covenant to the covenant of grace, the, the Israelite covenants, like what is the relationship here? What is being promised here? Um, how are they being fulfilled? When are they being fulfilled? Who are the members and who aren't the members and why? All of those kind of things. It's just, um, I wouldn't have had solid answers. I think it was about... I, I'm this is a rough estimate like six years ago that the 1689 federalism um, stuff really began to pop online. Um, so you're somewhat familiar with the 1689 federalism conversation now. Yeah. So many people are. It's, you know, um, the work of Sam Renahan has been big. There's a guy named Brandon Ad Adams, I think, online that has done stuff online. Uh, Richard Barcelos and uh, Sam Renahan's father, Jim Renahan as well, and uh, and others, Pascal Deneau up in Canada, 
um, advance 1689 federalism. And I remember being struck by this. I know oh, this is fascinating. It sounded like it was um, it sounded like it was something that was significantly distinct from like a gentry wellum stuff, gentry wellum stuff that I was um, familiar with from Southern. And right. so I thought, okay, this is this is really interesting. And uh, I read Sam Brennahan's uh, dissertation, uh, which is from Shadow to Substance. It's a fascinating work of historical theology that he did, and began to work through. Um, covenant issues at a deeper level and really thought that 1689 federalism was a was a good position this idea of the covenant of grace one covenant of grace revealed and inaugurated as opposed mm -hmm. to a Presbyterian system of one covenant of grace two administrations and that of course allows the 1689 federalists to say well of course the Abraham um, Abraham's children were in the covenant that's why that's why they received the sign of the circumcision so they were mm -hmm. in the covenant but the nature of the Abrahamic covenant, it was not an administration of the covenant of grace. Rather, it was a temporal, physical, conditional covenant that God was making with Abraham and his physical seed regarding physical land in, in Canaan. And that typifies or it shadows a greater covenant, covenant of grace. And I think you would maintain the idea or I did main, maintain the idea that uh, individuals are being saved by that covenant of grace. The, all people at all times have been saved by grace through faith in Christ. Right. Um, our, our brothers and sisters that came before Christ by looking forward to the Messiah and us by looking back to the Messiah. Um, but I think I think it's Richard Barcellus that says it in one of his YouTube clips that really kind of cinched the idea down. He, I think he goes as far to say the Old Testament saints are saved by promise and the, and the New Testament saints saved by covenant. So the idea that you don't have an inaugurated covenant of grace before the blood of Christ, you don't have it formalized, you don't have it established, um, but you do have one that's not yet inaugurated, not yet established, um, which if pressed, you could probably get to a place where you'd say you're, it's just a promise at that point. It's actually not a covenant. There's no, there's not been any cutting of it. And thus, is it really a covenant that you're talking about? Sure. Um, so at any rate, I, I held to that position for a good while, um, but then saw problems with it and, and, and multiple factors were at play there. But um, coming to grips with what a covenant really is, so what's the actual nature of a covenant? That was one. Um, what is the nature of the Abrahamic covenant is another. And um, what does it mean that Abraham's children did receive the sign of circumcision? So all of that got swirling, and uh, it was a, it was certainly a wild ride. Um, still is uh, on the on the on the back end of it. You hear, I was just talking to a brother uh, today that said, you know, he finds that most people, most of the times, people that uh, move on this particular issue, it's not um, it's not just a brass tacks logical kind of thing. Often yeah. it's, there's a community, it's being embodied and you go, OK, I see what's going on here. It really is a worldview thing, which yeah. is so weird to be on this side, um, this side of it. Now you go, OK, there's there's worldview stuff going on here. And and one of the things that has um, that stuck with me in kind of making the move um, over to the Presbyterian side of things is the beauty of the visible church, which means all the saints. And I found myself um, loving Baptists more and more, uh, even as even as everything happened. <laughs> like it, it was really something. I mean, there's something. I think there's something about Baptists having in their name the same thing as John the Baptist. Like, who doesn't oh, yeah. love John the Baptist out there saying, "Repent and come be baptized yeah. in the Jordan River"? You know, who who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There's something so um, so powerful about the thing that yeah. I found my love increasing. But th those are, it was basically an issue of covenant theology. And I think it's, it's uh, the, the big point is what's the nature of the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. If it's an administration of the covenant of grace, I, I could add this. If it's an administration of the covenant of grace, I think, um, you know, what happened with me is it, it was, it was an inevitable. Um, I think it's inevitable after that point. Although if you go back to what what people have called the 20th century American uh, Baptist position on covenant theology, that there were some that held the one covenant, two administrations, mm -hmm. like the Presbyterian brothers, but then found a way out of of infant baptism. Mm -hmm. 
So, but it seems to me now the the predominant position is more 1689 federalism, or some version of that, okay. um, which I think I think it would be really interesting to to have guys at Southern Seminary particularly continue to dialogue with the guys that are maybe more Reformed Baptist outside of the SBC and kind of talk about um, continuity and discontinuities among their covenant theology. Yeah, um, but that's it was a covenant theology issue with me. Okay. Flesh out a little bit more for, because so many people are Baptist or they're Baptist light, or, you know, I'm a Bible Christian, that sort of thing, AKA, you know, still Baptist. Most of the secret type churches, believers, baptism, that whole thing. That's, that's the way the landscape is for most of American churches. Um, what is, I guess, in a nutshell, especially for the, those listening and watching, Covenant theology and how does that really work? I mean, aren't we in the new covenant? Jesus says the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. What 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 are you talking about when you say covenant theology? Yeah, well, you have the word covenant is in the Bible, so I would start there with people. If you're a Bible believing Christian, um, then you're going to want to deal with the issue because it's it's there. No, it's in the New Testament about thirty times. It's in the Old Testament a host of times, and you say, okay, you know, what is this word? all about. Is this just a promise or is this something more? And um, I, the kind of a working definition is, um, and this is kind of drawing on John Owen, drawing on a bunch of Reformed Baptists that have written on the issue of covenant and, and uh, Presbyterians as well. Um, as a side note, I just did a, um, a follow-up to the James White, Doug Wilson, Pato communion debate. Um, okay. Reformation and Revival. You can find um, a video of that. Canon, Canon Press does video of that. And I highlighted like, I don't know, seven, eight books at the end of that. That would be helpful if you're wanting to dive into covenant theology more. Um, but I think a definition like the a solemn oath uh, from the Heavenly Father uh, to uh, man on earth of grace in and by Jesus Christ. So it has the idea of a solemn oath, but uh, you want you're going to want to add to it. You know, you want to add that creates a a relational bond that creates some kind of bond, and and then I would underscore that that's not um, it, it's it's man um, man and all that is his. So if you bring individualistic assumptions to that definition, then you would have God making all of these individual covenants with all of these individual people. Um, but covenant seems to carry a, a corporate idea. There are covenanted people. These are the covenant people of God, not just I am a covenant person of God. Yeah. So Solomon uh, from God, our heavenly father to man on earth of grace in and by Jesus Christ that results in this um, relational arrangement. Okay. I know sometimes um, even in my, before being a Southern Baptist, uh, though I was still Baptistic in California there at, the, at a Bible church, um, but still very Baptist, basically. There was a lot of like, well, you know, not bad mouthing Presbyterians, but like, well, can't they just read? This has to do with either they're not baptizing babies here, the Ethiopian eunuch, we've got the water, that's submersion, this and this and that. So that that seems to be and I've not you know looked at it too much, but I've looked at it more than I used to look at it. Um, that seems to be kind of a secondary thing. Explain a little bit then, like, what is baptism? Because I know debates of years gone by and Lutherans and Roman Catholics believe, you know, you're, we're baptizing infants to wash away original sin, a.k.a. original guilt. Usually that's kind of tied hand in hand. Uh, whereas Presbyterians, is that what's going on there? Or is it or what, what, what's happening there with baptizing an infant or small children? Yeah, the issue of baptism is a, a good one, obviously, to bring up, given the subject, but also given the times. I think um, the vast majority of um, American Christians, American evangelicals, would say that baptism is a profession of faith. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. I mean, here I am professing my faith. It's something that that um, I, the one being baptized, am doing. It's a, it's primarily a thing that I'm doing. Right. And um, it's like it's... um. Kind of before before God and these witnesses here idea being baptized and one of the works that I was working through at the time was Carl Truman's um, um, really fascinating work the rise and triumph of the modern self and he mentions um, 
he, he mentions in there that um, individual expression is the hallmark of, of modern man. Like this is what we are. Yeah. And he said, uh, we might not like the particular application to the transgender idea that who I really am on the inside, I must express and you must acknowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, but he said, we already bought into that way of thinking. And there was a line where he said, we used to think of our institutions as the entities which form us. Um, but modern man says institutions are now the platform upon which we express ourselves. Mm. This is what institutions are. And I think that that, you know, if you take that to the issue of baptism as as um, primarily an expression of my personal faith, well, I think there's some connections there or I saw issues there. I said, oh, boy, that I could see how somebody would get muddled and think, well, this is this is what this event is all about. This baptism is all about me expressing, you know, my faith and people seeing it and acknowledging it. Um, both your 1689 confession or your second London Baptist confession and the Westminster confession of faith um, talk about baptism actually being a sign to the one that is being baptized. So it's not the, it's a different idea than here I am, here I am being the one who's producing the sign. Uh, the other being, no, this is something that God is doing. God himself is signing. So there's a sign that you're, you're, being marked out, you're one of God's people now, um, which is a very different idea than how I think a lot of modern people are considering it. No, that's good. I appreciate that. Um, so then it's so then the the sign of baptism is similar to how circumcision was saying, as parents, we're going to baptize, we're going to baptize our children, and we're basically raising them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Cause I know sometimes people, and just kind of a second of that, again, people outside looking in believers looking in think, well, but they're not Christians. They're not followers of Jesus. Can you flesh that out a little bit more? Cause I know some people have had that. I mean, we do it. And I, I think it's uh Joel Webin, I think it is down in, uh, down in Texas. And he said, you know, I'm a Baptist, but I raise my kids like I'm Presbyterian. And I kind of feel the yeah. same way um, in the sense that, I've Therein heard it so lies much. the rub, Richard. Therein <laughs> lies the rub. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, but I, I've seen a lot in being, you know, a Baptist kid-ish, not Southern Baptist growing up, and not really coming to faith until my early 20s, uh, and then really understanding that, oh, this is, Jesus already did these things. This is already, he already paid the penalty. It's not about my works and my goodness and everything else. And finally confessing and, and, and him saving me and all that. But... Uh, I see and I've heard people over the years, well, I'm, how can I teach my kids to pray? How can I teach them the scripture? They're not Christians. I mean, I should just let them be unbelievers and then they come to faith and then we'll talk. I've heard parents talk that way. Not recently, but, you know, flesh that out for the person who's still like, yeah, but they're not Christians, Jared. They're not Christian. Like, you know, the five-year-old, you're going to teach him uh, the catechism. You're going to talk about the Apostles' Creed. You're going to teach him, him or her to pray. But they're not believers. What what are you guys doing? So kind of flesh that out for the person who's still scratching their head a little bit. Sure. First, as a background, I um, it's interesting you said I've heard people talk that way, but not recently. I'm um, and I, I don't know how much I have a read on the whole thing, but I I am I think that a lot of the Baptists, especially the Calvinistic Baptists, have gotten uh, far more um, have have gone far more in that direction of raising their children up. Um, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and not so much saying, I can't, I can't teach my child to pray because yeah. he's not a Christian though. I, I do think that people have said that and there, I'm sure that there are still people that are thinking that way. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a number of texts you're going to have to deal with. I mean, you have to say Proverbs says, um, raise up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart. Well, when does that start? You know, mm -hmm. that starts, um, you, you got to start that right when they're, when they're born um, in the book of Ephesians, we're told um, children obey your parents in the Lord. And, and so the command to them is actually to obey them in the Lord, which is a radically different thing than just obeying your parents. Mm -hmm. um, you, you actually, so to do it in the Lord means you're going to have to do it uh, by grace through faith in Christ. And my parental duty is to teach that child how to uh, live by grace through faith in Christ from from the very beginning, uh, Paul in the book of Corinthians, first Corinthians, 
um, speaks of our children being holy. And so there's like, there's this um, categorical deal. Now, um, again, for the, the American Baptist paradigm is going to say, well, you know, are you telling me that they're a born again Christian? Are you telling that's the way they're going to be thinking? Are you telling me they've already had a conversion experience? You know, yeah. and, and you're going to have to say, well, um, no, we're not saying that. Right? We're not saying that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt well, what's going on inside the the three month olds um, heart. Um, but at the same time, you have this other thing. You have this other layer. You have this text you have to deal with. It says, OK, but they're they're holy. And I'm supposed to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And they're supposed to obey me um, in in the Lord. And we want to raise them to trust the Lord and to love the Lord from the very beginning, which I find um I, I'm quite thankful that I think I think everybody's running me in that direction. Fam, family worship has just taken off. Yeah. You know? And so right away, uh, when you're worshiping God with the children, you got to work through um, the language of the plural, the singular versus the plural. Yeah. You know, what are you going to say? Um, Dad and mom are going to worship God, but not not you, Johnny, because you're two. And we don't know where you stand with him yet. You know, you right. can't do that. And so you find other ways. There, there's. There's other things uh, to say and the conscientious, um, the conscientious Baptist person is going to not want to presume. And um, uh, but this is why I think we need to work out the issue of of covenant, of there yeah. being an actual um, a, a right for a man to say, um, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, yeah. We're going to serve the Lord. This is just what we do. And so the children never know a day where they didn't love the Lord and God didn't love them. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, what, what changed about your eschatology or anything? So say five years ago, you're, you're plugging away. Everybody has some sort of eschatology, even if it, I heard it in, in seminary, a, a pan mill, you know, every, I was pan out at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, even I think a lot of people, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think I believe in the rapture. I don't think I believe in this or that. But you know, how can you believe in post-millennial? How can you believe things are getting better? Or how can you believe in no millennium? It says a thousand years, this and this and this. So a lot of kind of common questions for the quote-unquote layman um, that I've heard growing up, well, in the last 15 years from coming to faith. Uh, did this change your eschatology? If so, how? So, no, this didn't change my eschatology. Um, I been post-millennial for um, several years. So okay. um, you, you, going back there, that was there. I do think, I do think post-millennialism uh, plays a role in it, particularly with, with mo much of it is like a worldview. And I think it's also at play in, in hermeneutics because you're, you're thinking, you know, um, I'm not sure what I thought. <laughs> well, I mean, I grew up hearing the great commission all the time. And I grew up praying the Lord's Prayer all the time. But then when I adopted post-millennialism, the Lord's Prayer made a lot more sense because I was like, I remember thinking, nice. you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I just remember asking myself, like, did Jesus teach us to pray a prayer to the Father to which the Father's going to say no? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I know yeah. my son, I know my son told taught you to pray this way, but now I'm not going to bring my kingdom on earth as wow. it is in heaven. And so uh, it's at play there. And then I think it's at play. Um, every, every Everything is kind of downstream from the nature of a covenant. So you get the nature of a covenant down. You say, okay, there is this, um, there's this organized um, people. There's this organized covenant people of God on earth. Um, and now we're talking new covenant. Here they are. Mm -hmm. And if you look at um, Jeremiah 31 and what's going on there, what's going to happen in the new covenant, um, you can think eschatologically about that and say, OK, I think that's a very big um, Reformed Baptist text, obviously, because it says in the new covenant, they all know me. Yeah. And this covenant is not like the covenant that I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So we're, we've got a lot of discontinuity going here. And in this one, they're all going to know me. Um but the Presbyterian wants to say, well, I think there's um, there's an eschatological sense that this new covenant in the end, this will be the case. But we we don't need to overrealize that now. 
and say okay. that, that such is the case today. Gotcha. So let me push back and be that uh, interlocutor guy, the, the skeptic, and say, really think the things you don't believe in a millennium and or we're in the millennium now uh things are getting worse they're going from bad to worse there's wars and rumors of wars in a nutshell i know i've, I've actually got quite a bit of content on that as well um but for you how do you you know you're taking the bus or you're sitting drinking coffee and you know eschatology comes up because everybody does have an eschatology even people who are unbelievers um and you say, I'm post-mill, and they're like, well, what's that? What's your elevator speech, as it were, for post-millennialism and why you hold to it? Um, let's see. I would say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I just, I'd give him gospel first. Jesus Christ, if I'm on the bus, you know, I don't know if this yeah. guy is Christian. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, of course, it's related to, to the eschatological outlook because the world uh, was – indeed broken in our rebellion right and yeah. the son of god was born the virgin like he actually became man uh lived a righteous life died on the cross in our place for our sin rose again from the dead ascended into heaven sat down at the right hand of the father and then he poured out a spirit from that place upon mm -hmm. the church and um before before he ascends he tells uh, his followers all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me go make disciples of all nations Go yeah. baptize all nations, uh, teaching them to observe all I have commanded. And lo, I'm with you always until the ends of the earth. Now I'm going to send my spirit upon you and you're going to receive power. Then you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the very ends of the earth. I think anybody reading that that doesn't probably have the left behind uh, instincts that we all grew up with would say, oh, so like you guys do jihad and you believe that you're going to cover the whole earth, except you're just not going to do it with like guns and stuff. You're going to yeah. do it. You're going to do it through preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, teaching the word of God and praying. <laughs> and and yes. And so that's it. Jesus Christ, you know, the whole scripture points in that direction mm -hmm. that, that um, Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Yeah. And he's going to build up. I mean, here we are being this uh, building this being built up, as Paul teaches in the book of Ephesians. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. Uh, knowledge of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea as we're told. And Psalm 110 is a, of course, a glorious one. The Lord said to my Lord, we know that um, we know that we have um, God, the father speaking to the son. We have all mm -hmm. sit down at my right hand uh, until I make your foes a stool. And, okay. So, um, so in, in that, at that time, once all the enemies have been made his footstool, well, then there will be a return. Um, so I, I think the, the big post mill thing is just seeing, Oh, um, seeing that arc, okay, we were told in the beginning to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have dominion, um, and Jesus is that second Adam, and uh, in whom um, that dominion occurs. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a brief sketch of where yeah. I go. Okay, no, that's good. And would you say, because so many people get hung up on the millennial and the few conversations I've had actually on this channel with uh, Gary DeMar, he kind of like I don't want to say he dismisses it, but it doesn't really seem like, you know, we're so hung up on literal thousand years, literal thousand years, because I'm a literalist. You know, you'll hear people who are pre-mill dispensational, especially say that it's like, except for all these other places where you're not. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but what what does it like the post millennial like? Again, not to like be super nitty, nitty gritty, but so many people, that's kind of where they get they get stuck and they're just clogged. What does it mean then? Like, is there an actual millennium? Is it an actual thousand years? Can you flesh that out a little bit for, for our listener? Yeah. Well, the thousand years is coming from the book of Revelation, and everybody knows that it's the toughest book out there. So I would say don't hang don't hang your literalist uh, assumptions on um, on a on a book that is dealing with numbers that uh, don't refer don't don't speak in that literal way. Right. So I do think there's a millennium, but I don't think that it has to be a thousand years. And I think that um, that we are living in that millennium now. I think okay. there are two different, um, you know, you, you can hear people that talk about two different uh, post millennial views, one being like a futurist post millennialism, which believes in an earthly manifestation of the millennium. But we are not yet in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's more of an Augustinian post millennial view, which is um, there is an earthly manifestation of the millennium. And we're in it. Gotcha. 
Okay, cool. That's good. Um, so I guess the, one of the big questions probably people are just itching to know, how did you get traded from Founders Ministry to Canon and Christ Church uh, there up in Idaho for Florida to Idaho? How'd that, how'd that work out? Yeah, well, there were relationships with these guys for some time. Um, and it it seems that in the in the work that I was doing before, one of the things that really caused um, the ministry to to pop and, and to grow was uh, really thinking doctrine applied. You know, um, what is it? What does it actually look like to be a Christian right now today? And all of the relationships that I have and the duties and responsibilities that I have. And um, yes, very, very serious about doctrine. And then, yes, very, very serious about Christian living. And the guys out here in Moscow and uh, Christchurch and Canon Press and Cross Politic, you have all this flourishing, uh, you know, everyone knows there's a flourishing Christian community out here. And they're like, whoa, you know, so they're, people are saying, what's going on? Like, what's in yeah. the water out there to have this <laughs> classical Christian school, Logos school? I think there's like um, just tons and tons and tons of kids, K through 12. Mm -hmm. Um and then New St. Andrews College is also out here. How do you get this classical Christian college doing what it's doing with podcasts and publishing and all of that? Yeah. And so we were kind of mapping on to that. And um, so there was some there was some cross pollination that was occurring um, with conferences. We would host conferences down there in southwest Florida where we were and guys would come out. We talk and all that. Um, and so you, you had you had relationship before my um my covenantal catastrophe, as I, <laughs> as I have called it. Yeah. No, that's good. I appreciate that. Yeah, and that's something I did. I did see a few people, and I had inner inner conversations with people because I've got a kind of community of several content creators on YouTube as well who produce stuff and mapping a lot of stuff after what y'all do with uh, Canon Press in particular, just the videos and the content there. And I think it's great. I mean, even if there's slight differences with either soteriology or eschatology or whatever, but people wanting to make much of Christ and, and push in. I often will say using using big tech against itself and you know proclaiming the truth, proclaiming the gospel and using this platform um, on, against itself because all these people are God haters, right? Like they don't, they don't like Wojcicki, who Susan Wojcicki who owns or runs, you know, CEO of YouTube, as far as I know, it's not a Christian and she's very, very hostile. And yet at least, you know, the platform has gobs and gobs and gobs of Christians uh, doing that and at least kind of using the platform against itself, which is which is great. Uh, I forget what I was saying other than that. Yeah, well, it is. I mean, it is good that Christians are all producing truth, producing content. Uh, we need to fill it all up. And um, people are people are really, really hungry. I mean, you yeah. can look at some of the numbers and some of the works that are being published, whether that be a book or whether that be podcasts. But I, I would encourage Christians far and wide to start working out um, what it means to live as a Christian right yeah. now and go ahead and post it. Yeah. No. And that actually leads to my, my last question. Um, what, what do you say specifically to I know you said you appreciate Baptists even more and even getting out of my own echo chamber in California kind of looking at denominations as Californians do with an air of suspicion and like, well, you can't really be a, a very good Christian if you're linked up with some denomination. Right. And that's another, that's another uh, show, but um, <clears throat> currently being in the SBC and there's a lot of problems, but I think there are some, you know, there's definitely some good. What do you say to Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, people just non non denominationals, how are we to live uh, I, kind of a nutshell, kind of like Francis Schaefer, but what should we do, especially with just, I mean, even this last week with Roe v. Wade or two weeks ago, whenever it was, mm -hmm. and just, this is going to get overturned and there's this and that, and just the hostility from Disney, which let's be real here has been there for years. Uh, but critical theory being taught in schools and just, just this inundation of stuff. What do you tell people and how are you, uh, encouraging those who aren't in a, a flourishing Christian community there like Moscow. Boy, howdy. Yeah. I mean, I could talk for like two days on this. One. Um, <laughs> go. You had two hours. Go. Yeah. Um, 
there's so much that needs to be done. So I believe that the manifestation of social justice and critical race theory and intersectionality, the Black Lives Matter riots and the tyranny of COVID, all of those big things, mm. they all stem from a they all stem from a false religion. Mm. Uh, they, they they stem from idolatry, and particularly the idolatry in the false religion that we see in Romans chapter one, which is uh, people have turned away from worshiping the Creator to worship the creature. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a and when you think about worshiping the creature. Um, Okay, that could mean a lot of things. Um, you could you could actually be making your wood idols and all of that stuff and bowing down to it, or you could be just a secular humanist. Uh, so Vox Populi, Vox Day, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Okay, well, what's the difference between that, which we all know sounds bad, mm-hmm. and well, um, I serve my constituents, and so what my constituents want me to do is what I will do. Okay, uh, well, what if they want you to kill somebody? Well, I'm not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> or if they want you to steal something, now, I'm not going to do that either. Well, yeah. what law are you appealing to? Uh, what, <laughs> what what voice are you appealing to, if not the voice of the people? And the answer is going to be, I'm actually listening to the voice of God. You 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 must be listening to the voice of God, the voice of Yahweh, um, Romans 13. So this is, and I don't only mean this is for civil leaders. This is for fathers and mothers. This is for everybody. Uh, we we have to acknowledge that there is a God who is not creature, who is set apart from his creation. And we have turned away from that. And uh, in so doing, we're now manifesting all of these humanistic ideas, um, Mm. the secular humanist idea of equality, the secular humanist idea of justice, the secular humanist idea of pursuing that justice through, um, through intersectional systems and manipulation and power politics and everything else. Mm. It's all stemming from the worship of the creature. Uh, hence Romans one, when Paul says um, that this happens the, in, in the immediate wake of that, what happens? Well, they exchange natural relations for ones that are contrary to nature. So uh, LGBTQ and all, all of the, the soup that uh, goes with it, all of that is downstream from creature worship. Mm-hmm. Now the saints hear that and they know it's all bad and they, they will rightly say, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, but I think the problem is that we're uh, pantheistic-ish in our thinking. So we 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 think of God as the greatest being in a list of beings. Mm. And, uh, so so ants and then and then humans and then up at the top is God. But they're all in one system. And the problem is that's pantheist. Your your God is 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 one with all of everything else. Mm. Uh, we've lost the creator creature distinction. There is a creator and there's a creation. And the creator is not the creation. The creation is not the creator. And in that, and, and then you say, and the word of God. So the word of God comes to you from outside of creation. This is a word. You know, pastors need to be able to open up that word and say, you're about to hear a word that comes to you from outside of, of creation itself. And that's how much you need to fear it and bow down to it and yeah. reverence it. Um so you need that kind of thing operating. You need to see that this is not uh, um, there. There's a crazy um, woke jerk advance that has occurred here in the last three years. And I think that can be managed in certain ways. Maybe it'll calm down. I know things are going to get worse. I, I, I would be quite confident things are going to get far worse. Um, but really, at either either way, you have to know what happened here. And then you have to know how you have imbibed these particular errors, even if you haven't taken them to the place that others have taken them. Yeah. Um, so you need to think about your family. You need to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And you need to live distinctly Christian in everything you're doing, but not distinctly Christian in, in the way uh, that you're going to escape. And you're going to say, well, we're heading for the hills. You know, we're going to find a little tiny cave in West Virginia and we're going to go live in it. No, that's not going to work. That's not in accordance with what God has told you to do. He's told you to baptize the nations. He hasn't told you to run away from them and hide. Um, So you do really need to find other Christians that think um, the right way. You need to find Christians that think the way that you're thinking about these issues and say, okay, um, so we need our worship to not be infected with this pantheism or this paganism that really is kind of say, say that, um, I, I worship that even in reform circles that is really obsessed with guest reception. You know, uh, why are we so oriented that way? You know, mm. now I'm not saying I'll probably offend everybody because it'd be somebody, <laughs> who, 
guest reception service and you know somebody's going to go and exercise jihad on the guest reception and you know some fire <laughs> person to listen to those so i'm not i'm not saying that but really check what's going on there um with your worship are we do we believe that we're here for god we're here because there is a god we're here to worship god he's the one who's receiving our worship right right um and and there's going to be things that um those who are outsiders have no clue um and, and and if i take the time to fashion and shape everything that's going to happen in this worship service so that a person um you know could could understand everything then i'm going to be actually neglecting the the thing that i'm centrally called to do uh, yeah. Same thing in our evangelism, same thing in our parenting, same thing in our education, same thing in our vocations, same thing in our uh, relationships of uh, marriage. Um, all of that is um, needs to be distinctly Christian. And I think it's a it's a pretty it's a wild time and it's an exciting time to to be alive. But I I would encourage Christians uh, to take advantage of maybe some of these um online all the podcasts that whole world you're hearing a lot of good things um connect with those saints and yeah. those those who join with those who really want to build something um i think that you're gonna you we've seen the the left problem where people have gone woke and i think there's going to be um a problem of um of conservatives that don't really get what's going on at the root and they just kind of want to, they just want to go back just to the constitution and stop. And they kind of want to go back just to the 1950s and stop. Yeah. It's no slide against the 1950s or the constitution, praise God. And thanks be to God for, for both of them. Yeah. Um, but they want to stop there and they don't actually see what's going on here. So they're getting defensive, they're getting shrill and they're not sure what to do. They're just losing it. And, um, you're going to have to rebuild this thing in the ashes. And that's actually going to take a whole lot of hard work and a lot of hard, hard decisions. So yeah. um, that'd be my encouragement. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. You kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, I've seen that, especially, I mean, I'm in my first pastorate only not even two years in and one thing, and it's a, it's a small congregation, but very faithful people, at least those who come other churches and knowing in the area and having my pastor friends who have pastored here in the area as well, there really seems to be a distinction between what is church? What are we doing here on Sunday mornings and or Sunday nights and or Wednesday uh, or other days throughout the week? Is it just God's only here? And I think a lot of people think this, especially here in the Midwest South here in Kentucky of, well, I'm not going to go to church because God's there, but I'll come to a Bible study at your house or I'll come to a community group or and we've we've seen some of that and there's been good connections made but i think a lot of that's just kind of old timey whatever hanging around but the point is what is church is it people worshiping god is it christians worshiping god faithful followers of christ seeking to be fed and edified and worshiping the creator or is it outreach is it missions is it a is it a missionary organization and are we doing everything like you just said with guest reception and, and trying to cater stuff i think we see a lot of this with music and and how we do this and the cool guy pants and the sneakers and the no pulpit or the clear pulpit or the whatever and making things not church when it's quote unquote church it's like i mean i could go all day on that but my my bothersome with it is like the unbeliever goes to church that you're never going to win and it's never going to be an elton john concert or madonna or britney spears or miley cyrus or whatever right you're never going to get them and beat the world with the music, with the, I mean, I don't care if it's even Hillsong or Elevation, it's still going to pale in comparison to what the world offers. And if but it did, then it would be a really, really sad day. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But when the world comes to church, you know, maybe they grew up going to some Southern Baptist church, Presbyterian, whatever, and they haven't been in church in 20 years, they want Christians doing church, not pretending to be the world, which I'm thankful for. And it definitely seems like the, the services I've watched and listened to and you've our conversation and stuff and others that Christ Church and others are convictionally know we're Christians we're doing church this way you want to come and join us you want to hear the gospel you want to hear Bible teaching and all this stuff praise God come on but we're not doing it for you we're doing it for God and that's and that's something that I think people really really need to wrap their head around once again um, I don't know did you have anything else you want to add no I think that's good Oh, well, it was it was the Kyperian. You, you 
done a few different videos uh, on Canon Press there for Kuyperianism. Mm -hmm. uh, can you flesh that out? Give like a couple minutes, kind of what that looks like. You've probably already touched on it some, uh, but what does that look like? Yeah. Um, well, I have written a few different things on it, but the, I mean, um, Kuiper's famous quote obviously is one way to encapsulate what what um, what people mean when they say Kuiperian that he that Jesus Christ when he looks over the whole wide earth there's not a single square inch over which he does not cry mine yeah. uh, so it, it's thinking about the world in which we live is under the lordship of Christ and which means um, not only am I under the lordship of Christ which which um, all of kind of American evangelicalism, um, the healthy forms of it believe that um, and then they also believe that about the church Jesus Christ is Lord of the church and so you still have a lot of conservatives that stood firm during COVID um, but they didn't actually have to be uh, robustly Kuyperian in their thinking to do so hmm. uh, there's a lot of people that folded and they obviously weren't robustly Kuyperian either but even right. some of the even some of the conservatives that stood strong and thanks be to God that they did um, but even they don't have to be thinking about the Lordship of Christ outside the church because the attack came on the church building. I mean, they're, right. they're fencing off church buildings here. So yeah, you can say, no, Jesus is Lord around here. You can go rule how you want to out there, but you're not going to be able to come in here. That could be the error. Uh, yeah. But Kuyperianism says, no, no, he's Lord out there too, by the way. Mm. And you need to, you need to submit to him. You need to obey him. And uh, that makes people, uh, uh, I think it kind of blows up a lot of people's um, paradigms for how they're thinking about their lives. And they say, well, you know, you mean to tell me that my governor um, has to submit to Jesus Christ? And the answer is, yeah. And, you know, yeah. Do you mean, you mean my governor is a servant of Yahweh? You know, yeah, he is. But what if he's not a born again Christian? What if he's never been baptized? <laughs> what if he's, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he's still a servant of Yahweh? And he has to do what Yahweh says to do. Um, so that's getting into those various spheres. Of course, the same as in the home. So the Lordship of Christ in the home, that Jesus is actually Lord of the family, um, which is, of course, related to uh, what we were talking about earlier about covenant theology and infant baptism, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So Jesus Christ is is Lord of all. Um, we need to we need to work through what that means and then its implications gotcha i did remember um you got time for one more question yeah we i think it was before we started uh the show you had mentioned a deficiency because you went to southern as well like i did uh and you mentioned a deficiency within the spc a bit uh within worldview um what did you mean by that and talking about kind of that helped with your transitioning to more of a covenant Presbyterian uh, view of biblical faith. What does that look like? And what, it, where are the deficiencies that you saw and or see say within SBC, big Eva, just kind of the, the worldview lacking. Yeah. Um, so I, I've uh, spoken to the pragmatism that I see um, in much of evangelicalism. And um, when I'm using that word, I mean, um, Considering um, we pay close attention to the way that the world operates, and that's good. You know, you see cause and effect, um, but you end up just living by sight rather than living by faith because you, you've you learned how the mechanics of this thing. And um, and then you work those mechanics and you, you know, it gets results. And God has wired up the world to work. You know, when you work with the grain, good things happen. Um, but you have to work with the grain by grace through faith in Christ. You have to work uh, with the grain, uh, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. You have to work with the grain and pray. And so if you if you begin to um, conceive of the world and, and even as a as a shrewd person, you know, if I go here, this is what's going to happen. If I make this move, then then this is likely what's going to happen. And you can spell a lot of that out, but you leave off God in heaven. And, and so uh, you say, well, I want to consider which hill to die on. Right. Well, you should consider which hill to die on. Not every hill's um, worthy of dying on. Um, and yet, um, you know, when you're when you're counting the cost, um, you can't leave off God. <laughs> you can't leave out the spirit. 
So like Elisha's servant, right? You know, there he is. He looks out and sees this great army and he's scared to death. And Elisha says, you know, open his eyes, God, that he'd see um, there are more with us than are with them. That's living by faith, not merely um, living pragmatically. So it's related to that um, that worldview issue that begins to um, worship God, but in pantheistic terms where he is he has become, you know, he. Uh, I know how God operates such that he is actually not distinct anymore. He's not the God that turns water into wine. He's not the God, you know, who, who brings forth these miracles and feeds people with five loaves and two fish. And so I, you just drift into that way of thinking um, that I think can be, can be um, quite harmful. I, I don't know. Um, I have not actually read the text of Alito's leaked um, Supreme court, you know, opinion. But I've heard uh, from somebody who really knows his stuff that he's concerned that uh, it actually reinforces Roe v. Wade um, because there's some kind of admission saying that we don't know what this thing is inside the inside the mother's womb. Um, we, we, and if that's the case, then you would have you could see this kind of pragmatic thinking going on with the with the um, the victory that the overturn of Roe is. So praise be to God that Roe is going to be overturned. I mean, who's not going to say praise be to God? We're going to Amen. throw festivals for this thing. Um, and yet if you overturn it while granting the presupposition that says we don't know what it is, um, you got huge problems. You, you actually didn't deal with you. You didn't deal with it. And uh, I think there's similar things with the woke stuff. So, like, if you drive out wokeness, um, but it's like it's all external, you know, it's all like uh, the wokeness is still there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, still, you're still woke in your heart, but you're just not woke on your podcast anymore. <laughs> because to do so is no longer advantageous because the dean of your school will fire you. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, praise be to God that deans of school are going to fire people that say woke stuff on their podcasts. I mean, praise be to God. You can't, that's the problem. You can't thank, you're going to thank God for that. Yeah. But you have to be saying, okay, but that's not enough, right? What we really need is genuine repentance, genuine growth, genuine maturity. You know? mm. um, so that's a, that's a little sketch out of, um, of the danger of this, uh, this pragmatic worldview. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You had mentioned that, I think, um, as well, right around as before we were recording, just the, a lot of people in the last few years have latched on to the, the woke ideology because of pragmatism, because of kind of church growthy type of stuff and 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 just being more outreachy, which, again, uh, we want to be outreachy. Of course, there's problems in the world. There's racism and get OK, sure. You know, let's let's move this further. Obviously, uh, we would both agree that that's the wrong way to do it. Uh, entirely, but yeah, that's, I think a lot, of, I think a lot of people did that and it's, that's another show, but maybe 15, 20 years ago with kind of the new young restless reform, because a lot of those guys <laughs> that were a little bit older now, you know, were so young and Calvinism, Calvinism are now wokeism, wokeism. And you're like, ah, I think you're just a pragmatist here. It seems like you're, you're riding these waves, but that's, that's my personal opinion. So anyway, uh, do you have anything, last things you want to add? No, that's it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. No, I appreciate the time. Dr. Jared Longshore. Appreciate it, brother. And uh, yeah, until next time, we'll see everybody later. All right. Thanks. <laughs>